gets a mic and a chair. We do. Oh, Hello. It's very organized. It's like they've done this before. Seriously. Mm -hmm. So, I was telling the audience before, uh, I saw Bagman in it was 2014, um, and was one of those films where I'm like, I really want this to be a feature. So, so what's the story about We how, did too. <laughs> so what was the story about, how, about the origin of Bagman and how it became Kim? Uh, firstly, thanks for having us, guys. Um, let's try. I hope you enjoy the film. Firstly, uh, help us keep that MBJ secret, if at all possible. <laughs> We're shocked that it's not uh, all over the internet at we've, this point. We've kept it for about two years, and we're about a week out, so it'd be nice to keep that for another week. But sorry, what, what was your question about Bagman and, and How evolving Batman, it? The origin of Bagman and making making a short Detroit, and then turning it into a feature. Well. We, me and Josh have been directing uh, for the last sort of 15 years together. Um, we do a lot of advertising and still money in that industry, which is great. And so the, the problem is that uh, we're telling 15, 30, 60 second stories most of the time. And it, uh, it takes a, a different kind of storytelling to do that. And we were getting a little over it. So we wanted to tell something a little longer, a little quieter, uh, something a little more dramatic. And that's where Bagman uh, came up. Yeah, I guess we wanted to clash. I don't know how many people here have seen Bagman. Um, it's the core elements of this are in it, but it's it's a pretty quiet short. Uh, we shot it in Harlem mostly, uh, and and in upstate New York. And it it was basically about clashing two tones, two genres, and making the audience convinced that they're seeing one thing and then flipping the tables and making them go, okay, I didn't fucking expect that. And <laughs> I guess we took the structure and put it on this and we took the key ingredient, ingredients, which was the African-American teen, the mystery bag, and this big, crazy plasma space rifle and from a silly video game and tried to make it fit in the real world of a 2018 sophisticated drama, if we could. I should just mention that uh, Bagman premiered in this theater uh, in 2015 at South by, uh, I believe Claudette Godfrey's here. So big, big uh, thanks to, yes. to those guys. This is a full circle moment for yeah. both of us. Great. <laughs> so, I've got to ask, where do you find Miles Truitt? Who uh, um, plays Eli? My, Miles, I mean, look, the, the, the film, uh, doesn't work without a good kid and so we uh, we found him in Atlanta we did a search like you do across about 250 kids we didn't have that uh, Harry Potter money so we didn't go around <laughs> the world fine it's also a, a limited brief uh, you know African-American kid 14 years old quiet very quiet sort of introspective sensibility to him uh, super subtle a lot in the eyes and and we found him he was the last kid that came in Literally the last kid. Yeah, out of about 250, 300 kids, he was the very last kid, which is crazy. Yeah, he, he was amazing. He had this really emotional maturity to him and could, you know, throw punches with some of the, the big talent. I mean, him and uh, Dennis Quaid were besties by the end of it. There were many moments where we looked over and we'd just done an emotional scene between Dennis and uh, Miles, and they'd be like rapping a trap song in the front of a car somewhere. <laughs> like they had a great relationship. We're going to throw it out to the audience for a few questions. Uh, anybody got a question? Stick your hand up and uh, say it loud. There's about four of those guns that exist. Uh, we built like rubber ones. We built ones we could throw around. We built two that lit up and, and fully extended and the whole deal, and you're not getting any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Have there been any conversations about making like versions of that uh, gun? What, that like, a, ner a Nerf endorsement or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Nerf uh, no, there like hasn't been, but I know there should, be. Some, like, there should be. Someone's keeping them under lock and key, and I think their name's Lion King. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I want, in, in my mind, we're going to do like that costume and prop kind of thing in a glass case somewhere in a theater. That'd be fun. I'm looking forward to Halloween. I want to see who rocks up with cardboard versions of that plasma gun. Another question for the audience. Okay, uh, waving hand right there. Yeah, yellow mouth. So, um, do you think Miles getting in trouble at school was, was he the bully or the bully? Yeah, that's a great question. 
No one's asked that before. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I Dan, Dan, I want to hear your answer, man. Uh, <clears throat> there was a um, there's a kid that you guys cast who was walking out of the principal's office. Yeah, dyed hair, much beard. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't very. And good. he was he was taller and you know he was more built than uh, than Miles was. So when I showed up on set the day of, I just figured that the big kid had been the aggressor. You know. Yeah, we, we kind of imagined that uh, someone was giving him shit for his mom dying and uh, being adopted, you know, probably something along those lines, and he started to go down the path of his older brother, someone that he'd heard a lot about. Uh, his dad obviously has a lot of resentment for him, and I think the Dennis Quaid character, how he was probably, his biggest fear was Eli turning out like Jimmy. Yep. And talking about casting, James Franco, mm -hmm. bringing all his Franco-ness. Yep. Uh, <laughs> he, he went full Franco on this Oh, one, he right? did. Uh, <laughs> never go full Franco. It's a, it's a very fine line uh, between, that he dances in this thing that has comedy on one side, uh, emotion in the middle, and scary, fucked up darkness on the other side. And... Depending on who you are, a lot of people think he's really intimidating and scary in this thing, and I, I think he dances between those three things really carefully. And in the funeral scene with his brother, I mean, this movie's about family, and even if you're the bad guy and you think you're in your own movie, you're in a revenge movie because some dick called Jimmy killed your brother. And I think he's got a level of emotion in that scene that really hits me every time I see it. And he's also really fucked up in the pissing in the gas station scene. And he's, you know, has funny moments as well. So I, I, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting movie to watch with an audience because half don't know whether to giggle and half don't know whether to fall back in this seat a little bit. And it is a, a, an interesting tone, you know, just because he is so charismatic and, and scary. How do you write for it? Or is there a point that you go, Okay, I've written this, and who can possibly play like the gas station scene? It's a good point. James Franco. Like, this, it's this a good point. Me. I mean, talk to him about it, but we, we struggled with casting on that a little bit because we were like, there's a lot of things we've got to hit here. I, yeah, I mean, uh, while we were writing, I, I remember just kind of going, this is going to be the brother's problem and not mine. You know what I mean? Like, it was just kind of like, <laughs> we wrote a character that's just right. so like weird and. and uh, I remember trying to write him light just because I figured there was going to be room for interpretation once you guys figured out who was cast. So I, I remember just kind of writing him as scary as possible and sometimes a little bit of a little bit funny, but I never had a picture in my head for like cadence or wardrobe. And then I remember you guys were already up in, in Canada getting yeah. ready to shoot the thing and you sent me pictures yeah, we of Franco in costume and he had like a mullet and he was wearing penny loafers and I was like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had a Cosby sweater on. And... Yeah, yeah, like, it's, it's a really bizarre like, yeah. but then, you know, we, we I got there. A, we photoshopped a, a, a haircut from an yeah. English football player and put it on Franco and sent it to him and he was like, I'm down, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do to me, man. The, the thing about James is that he's very willing to be, a, you know, a puppet for directors. He's just like, he rocks up and he's like, whatever you guys want to do, man, I'm, I'm down. I, I like the script. And we showed him the picture of the Photoshop thing. He was like, God damn. All right. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, and we had one hour. He's just a very busy guy. So he rocked up. We had one hour to go through tattoos, haircut wardrobe for the entire movie that we'd already pre-selected and tried him on him and had to get his opinion and then go all right let's get in front of camera and shoot the first scene one hour it was aggressive yeah, he's a machine but he was cool with it all and if he had have you know kicked his heels in for a single thing we wouldn't have made it but he was great okay another question for the audience uh i saw a hand go right in the middle there. the uh, bagman works on its own and then you decide to make it a full length but then by the end we're set up for like multiple movies yeah. potentially like wh what point did it turn to that and maybe related is michael b jordan's involvement related to that um it's a, it's a good question i can't remember man it was so long ago <laughs> I, I don't know if we're short-sighted or not but we we kind of um concentrate on what we're doing instead of thinking like too far ahead and uh bagman at the time was a self-contained story it was a short film uh we, we were just wanted to do a 15 minute short. We lived in New York at the time. We actually, funny enough, we don't talk about this very often, but we wrote it originally um, 
about a kid in the Congo that had telekinetic powers and it became this uh, an English doctor doing measles inoculations and he ended up on a road trip, like a, a runaway. So it was a chase film in the Congo. And it's a shocker, no one wanted to make that movie. <laughs> yeah. and, well, it was, it was a challenging movie to, to get financed. And so someone said, uh, Guillermo del Toro's producer actually said, have you thought about doing a short based on it? And we went and budgeted out in Nigeria and South Africa and it was far too expensive. And right then, Chronicle trailer dropped, uh, M83 music videos came out, um, X-Men First Class, young Magneto throwing knives around, we're just like, too many fucking telekinetic <laughs> kids, like we're not jumping on this train. So we ditched it and we just went, we lived in New York at the time, and we said, let's make him Black Kid from Harlem instead of the Congo, and let's go a giant crazy sci-fi rifle. Right. So that's, that's what Bagman, that's how it was born. I feel like he didn't answer your question though. No. What, what was your question? More than, it used to be more than one movie. Now. Yeah, so, oh, okay. so I guess what I was saying is, so that was Bagman, that was, it was a self-contained thing. And then once people started to talk about it, we um, came up with what Kin could be, and we thought, let's not miss an opportunity. And then ultimately for the ending of this, you know, we, we just like movies that leave a story and a character and a world open so that you can have a conversation in the car on the way home, honestly, and just talk about where does this go? Like, yeah. And I remember when we were writing, we wrote, the helmet comes off and a well-known actor is underneath. Something like that. <laughs> literally, literally, yeah. Dan wrote that in the script. And we all talked about it and went, that'd be dope if we could get Hugh Jackman or something. And, and then when we really got into it, we were like, so Michael saw the short and really liked it. He's a big sci-fi fan, he's a big comic book fan. And he basically uh, invited us out to dinner and said, I'd love to be in anything that you guys do. I really like your stuff, which is awesome. Um, and then we looked into it and said, okay, well, we've got this character at the end and you'd be perfect for it. And the more we thought about it, we were like, I don't know why we didn't think about this before. You're gonna have a 14 year old black kid looking up at someone who's 14 years his senior and looking into the eyes of someone that is super powerful. And that means a lot on a big screen. And so we, we lent into Michael B. Jordan and asked him and he said, yeah, man, just tell me when. So it was great. Okay, next question. Uh, red shirt midway up on the end there. Hey, um, so I had a question. Um, how, well, how, is the design process, how is the design process for the gun and then the helmets to not look like, like anything else? Because it uh, looked really good. I, I felt, you felt it was original? Yes. Oh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> if you said the opposite, I'd be like, no. Uh, so, the, well, obviously the short set up what the look of the weapon was. Um, we wanted to create something that in stages you explore and you, you, you find out what it is and you... It's so a, it's a box. Like it's, it's, it's a metal box. And it's you got a muzzle. It's just it's just like a metal box, and, and then it has multiple it. multiple modes and all of that kind of thing. So we wanted something that could sort of throughout the film you 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 learn, uh, and when you pick it up, you don't even know how to hold it. You don't know which is the front, which is the back, that kind of thing. Um, so that was the weapon. We we worked with a team called Super Vixen in Sydney, Australia. We actually worked with them when we were back in post in a prior life. Uh, and we asked the guys if they wanted to be involved and they said, yeah, hell yeah, a giant sci-fi gun for a movie, that sounds amazing. And so we designed the thing for the short and then it's not often that you get a chance to have a second go at something and it was really interesting to kind of go back and go, all right guys, we're doing this in a Hollywood movie, do we want to use exactly the same thing or do we want to sexy it up and do something a little different? And we pretty much kept it the same, except I mean, it changed a couple lines here and there. Improved it a little bit. I, I feel like we made it a little bit more of a perfect uh, geometric shape as opposed right. to an odd sort of back. There was a few awkward scene. parts about it, which we changed, but generally it's the same shape, same weapon. And uh, then the helmets, uh, a brilliant conceptual designer, uh, works a lot in video games. Help me with his last name, man. His name's uh, Navan. Navan. You can look him up. Oh, it's a hard name, guys. Um, he's from Montreal, he's, 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 he's brilliant. And he sent us a whole bunch of different helmet designs and a lot of them felt very G.I. Joe-ish and very, you know, a lot of things we'd seen, Transformers and just like really bitty for no reason. And we wanted something that felt 
like if they were flying past you at 100 miles an hour on the freeway you just go that's a cool motorcycle helmet you know <laughs> yeah but also it, it had like an extended forehead and extended chin so it kind of you could look at it and go oh maybe they're alien underneath it and we wanted to have that question mark where you're like i don't really know and technically they're bad guys for the whole movie they're coming after him and you don't expect that it's michael b jordan underneath <laughs> <laughs> okay and i i have to we were actually kind of uh, nerding out about this. Uh, I'm a huge post-rock fan oh. and a vital part of this score and why this film is so unique in a lot of ways is getting Mogwai to do the score rather than going like, well, yes! I did that, did that play? Uh, uh, a quarter of the audience. Uh, <laughs> Mogwai fans, yes. Uh, rather than going like the standard, you know, op you know yeah. orchestral, yeah. Sort of standard rock So that was a it's very... Really set to tone. How do you get Mogwai? Well, that was a very specific decision at the very beginning. We just wanted to get as many things involved in this movie that we would be fans of if we were watching this film that we weren't involved in. And that's artwork, and that's the, the, the composers. It's, it's, it's so many different things involved with the film. We're trying to get sophisticated stuff out there into the marketplace that feels different. And so we could have gone with a normal composer, but I feel like it all ends up sounding the same in, in, in a lot of ways, unless you do something really different. And we really loved what like uh, M83 did with Oblivion or, or Chemical Brothers did with Hana and, and right. things like that. And just being able to give uh, a band the opportunity to score an entire film. And have a life outside the film as a soundtrack. It's super selfish. We just wanted a vinyl <laughs> from Mogwai. And, and halfway through they were like, you guys know we're gonna make a full studio album of this, right? We're gonna extend your cues from the film the, from 30 seconds to seven minutes. We're gonna make full length tracks and then we're gonna, probably gonna to tour it. And we're like, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> this is a dream come so, true. Yeah, so we basically had a playlist that went for about 13 hours that represented Bagman. And then when we started transitioning over and Dan came in, we just kept it going and we passed that over really quickly. Yeah, they said, listen to it. It's 18 hours long. <laughs> and so there was just music to write to, but also just things that had the feeling. And there was a little bit of hip hop in there, a little bit of folk, a lot of score, a little bit of post rock. And Mogwai was in it like 40 times. And, and so we were just like, why don't we ask Mogwai? Like, this just makes a lot of sense. They're one of our favorite bands. One of, one of the lessons we learned on this film is just ask, honestly. Like, if, you go, if you're working on cool shit, People want to work on cool shit, yeah. just ask. And a lot of the time we got a yes. So. so we were very lucky that we're at WME, they're at WME, and it was a very easy ask at the end of the day. And we sent it out to them, we sent them Dan's script, and suddenly we're on a phone call with the band members from Mogwai, and they're telling us how much they're getting sent material all the time, big movies, they, and they turned it all down. They've only done documentary and TV work in France. It's pretty obscure stuff. And then here we are with Plus our, <laughs> I know. and then we're here with our, you know, kind of indie, kind of Hollywood big movie. And we're like, sent them the script and they said, look, we really emotionally connected with it. And we'd love to do your first movie. And we just went, fuck me, Mogwai. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very us. Well, I think that's all the time we've got for the Q&A because I think you guys have got some posters. Okay, we do, guys, we've got a rad poster that if you guys want to stick around and get, take it without the signatures, take it with the signatures, I don't care, but the poster's dope, so you should come yeah, one, uh, Again, what Josh was saying, one of our favorite artists in the world is Ken Taylor from uh, Australia. He works a lot on Mondo stuff, as you know, and uh, he did a dope uh, Ken poster, so you can have one. Josh and Jonathan for the amazing kid. Tell all your friends about it. Tell everybody who want to see this about it. Just, just keep the mic. Yeah, George. Guys, thing. just. Shh, shh, shh. We, we, we'd love your support. Like anything you want to post about it. If you did like it, if you did enjoy it, if you felt like it was original and, and cool, that would help us. It's, it's a small movie, man. Like honestly, this is me, Josh, and and Dan was, uh, you know, awesome to come in and help us. But we're pulling it uphill. So. Uh, yeah, thank you. Keep the MBJ thing to yourself, but other than that, go nuts. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>